So um, this is kind of an extension of what we did last week. We're still talking about tone, but we are adding a few new terms to the, um, the unit. And when we get to our big assessment, we are going to take an assessment for this unit. It is going to be to determine the differences between diction, imagery, and details. So I do suggest that you guys keep this, these notes in a safe spot because when we do our huge assessment, this is what it's going to be over. If you're writing down notes, uh, what's in blue is the stuff that you would want to take notes on. It's the important part. You don't have to write anything for this slide since we already took notes on this, but it is just a review for you. So just to reiterate, tone is the writer's or speaker's attitude toward a subject. So in this case, we're going to take a look at how they use different words and details and images to show their attitude toward that subject. Okay, so again, that was just a review. So let's talk about diction first because we just did an assignment that uses diction and connotation. So when we talk about diction, it is the connotation of the word choice. So all of those words that we looked at today on that practice, all were practicing with diction and connotation. Questions to consider when you're talking about diction is what words does the author choose? Why did they choose those words? And what are those connotations? So if we're looking at an example, we talked about the word laugh earlier today. And um, there's lots of different variations of the word laugh, but it all has some sort of different meaning. So we use the word giggle, which we said was positive, and we also use the word snicker, which we said was negative. Um, a couple of other words that we might say are guffaw. If you've ever heard that word, it's like a big, boisterous, loud laugh. That doesn't necessarily have a positive or negative connotation. It depends on the context, but typically we have that feeling of like being really loud, right? Same thing with roar. Next is imagery. So imagery is descriptive language that appeals to understanding through the senses. Can anybody tell me what the five senses are when we talk about imagery? Sight, sound, taste, touch, smell. Those are your five senses. Um, or it could be feel as well, so touch slash feel. So when we're trying to identify imagery, we wanna make sure we think about what images the, authors are, the author is using and what does he or she focus on in a sensory way. So they might choose to focus on um, the setting really a lot, right? Like they're talking about where something is and they really focus on that rather than focusing on the characters. So that really does set our tone of where the story is taking place. If we look at the example sentence at the bottom, it says the eerie silence was shattered by her piercing scream. So you can definitely hear a piercing scream, right? You think about like some blood curdling scream. Um, also the word eerie has like a feel to it, right? If you think of the word eerie, it makes you kind of shudder. Um, and this, those words and those images that the author created might make us believe that um, we are, the tone is like mysterious or scary, right? Because based on the images that they um, presented for us. The last idea that we wanna consider is details. So details are facts that the author chooses to include in a piece. And the questions we consider here are what details does the author include? What do they imply? Why do they include them? And what are the connotations of that detail? So to consider the note at the bottom, it says that the speaker's perspective shapes what details are given and which are not. So if the writer was doing a mystery book, I love to talk about mystery a lot and murder mysteries. Um, they might choose to include specific details about characters because later in the story, it might help us make a decision about who the murderer actually is, okay? So sometimes you might read something and you're like, well, they really didn't have to tell us this, but it does shape the way I'm picturing it in my head. So again, these are the facts that they choose to include in a piece. And this one is probably the trickiest to identify, so we're gonna do a lot of practice with this.
One more thing to talk about is shifts in tone. Um, we are eventually going to do some practice with poetry as well. So not just stories, but also poetry. And sometimes in poems, there is a shift on a topic um, about the author's tone, or the speaker's tone. So there's this example I love to give because Shakespeare has a sonnet that is, so a sonnet's like a little poem um, that starts off about how ugly this girl is, how she has a terrible face, how she's kind of overweight. And he goes on and on and talking about how she's just not attractive at all. But by the end of the poem, he ends up making a statement that's like, I don't really care what she looks like because I'm gonna love her no matter what. So it shifts in tone because at the beginning we think he's mocking her and he thinks she's really ugly, but then at the end it changes to a very loving tone because he says that he loves her no matter what she looks like. Some indicators that show this shift could be keywords like but or yet or however, um, sometimes different punctuation, and then even a change in paragraph. So with a sonnet, there's always a change in paragraph, and that signals us that there's a shift. So what we're going to do now is we are going to um, take a look at an example here. So I'm going to read this passage to you, and then you guys are going to tell me um, what images we see, the diction, and then the details as well. Okay? So I'm going to read this, follow along with me. It says, and this is a piece from Marigolds, and Marigolds, by the way, are flowers. Miss Lottie's Marigolds were perhaps the strangest part of the lot. Certainly, they did not fit in with the crumbling decay of the rest of her yard. Beyond the dusty brown yard in front of the sorry gray house rose suddenly and shockingly a dazzling strip of bright blossoms clumped together in enormous mounds, warm and passionate and sun golden. The old witch woman worked on them all summer, every summer, down on her creaky knees, weeding and cultivating and arranging, while the house crumbled. For some reason, we children hated those marigolds. They interfered with the perfect ugliness of the place. They were too beautiful, they said too much, that we could not understand. There was something with which the old woman destroyed the weeds that intimidated us. I think it was the flowers we wanted to destroy, but nobody had the nerve to try. So, first, we are going to come up with examples of imagery that we see in this piece. So can anybody tell me or point out a sentence that shows imagery? So remember, we're doing looking for the five senses. So sight, sound, taste, touch, or smell, or feel. Beyond the dusty brown yard, that sentence. Very good. So I'm gonna do imagery in green. So dusty brown yard, can you see that? Yeah, right? We can see the dusty brown yard. So that's a great example of imagery. Somebody give me another one. A dazzling stripe on a strip of bright blossoms. Very good. The dazzling strip of bright blossoms. They're talking about the, the flowers here. We can see just how bright they are. They're all in one line up against the house. What? Down on her creaky knees. Very good. We can hear that, right? Freaky knees. All right, what else? Mm, warm and passionate and sun golden. Very good. So that includes two here. We have warm, we can feel the warmth, and we can feel the, or we could see the golden sun. Well, actually, in this case, they're explaining the flowers to be sun golden, so looking like the sun. Anything Perfect else? ugliness. We're going to come back to that one um, because I'm going to argue that that is word choice and diction. So let's move on because that's a good segue to the next part. So perfect ugliness. Those are words that the author chose to include that makes us feel a specific way. He didn't just say that it was ugly. He said it was perfect ugliness, which changes the meaning. So that's a great example for diction. So we already did imagery. We came up with some images, things that we can see and hear and feel. Now what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a word or like a set of two words together 
that change the tone. So think about the connotation worksheet. So what words stick out to us in this passage? Um, old witch. Would that be one? Mm -hmm. Old witch. Right? So again. We use that intimidator though. Um, let me see here. Yes, very good. So intimidated, intimidated us. The wheat didn't just scare them, it intimidated them. So that changes the tone as well. What else? Children hated you. Yes, so they hated them. They didn't dislike them, they hated them, which changes again the meaning entirely. Destroyed. Yes, good, destroyed. So she didn't just pull the weeds, she destroyed the weeds. Good, what else? Anything else? So also we could say the crumbling decay, right? And even the enormous mounds. So those are all really great um, <clears throat> examples of diction because their connotation changes the tone of the piece. Let's try one more. Let's try uh, details here now. Details. So what are some details that the author chose to include that we didn't really need to know, but changes the tone of the piece? And there might be some overlap with what we've already underlined. I think it was the flowers we wanted to destroy. We could. So we could say here that it was the flowers we wanted to destroy, right? Because in this case, that's a detail that if we wouldn't have known, if they wouldn't have added that, we maybe wouldn't have ever known that they wanted to actually get rid of them because they do talk about how beautiful they are throughout the whole piece. And then all of a sudden they talk about how they actually wanted to destroy them. So that's a great example. Mary goats were perhaps the strangest part of the lot. Yes, good. So marigolds were the strangest part of the lot. Again, detail we didn't need to know, but it automatically sets the tone that the marigolds were the prettiest part about this whole piece, or this whole um, area. So again, details that the author chose to include, but we didn't really need to know. In front of the sorry gray house. Okay, good. So the sorry gray house. And this one actually, I'm actually going to say, I think that's a great example, but I think it works better with diction, the sorry gray house, and imagery with the gray house. Still a great example, but I think we, it looks better with diction and imagery. We could even say like the fact that the author chose to tell us that she worked on them every summer. Again, not a fact that we needed to know, but now it changes the tone that this woman is always doing this every year, year after year, and the kids are always anticipating that she does it every year. How about one more of anything? Can we do one more of diction details or imagery? They did not fit. Okay, I'm about to, about to go on it. Yeah. Uh, could you read a little bit more of the sentence for me? Hi. Um, they did not fit with the um, crumbling decay. The oh. fact that they didn't fit with it. Got it. What do you think that is? Diction, details, or imagery? Details and imagery, kind of in the, in the middle. That's good. I would say that it would probably be more of a detail because it kind of goes along with this first sentence here too that we talked about with it being the strangest part of the lot. Great example. Anything else guys before we wrap up? All right, you guys did a great job with this for your first time.